good morning and welcome to Primary Nature Live 2021. It's really, really great that so many of you are here to join us for today's live lesson. Now, some of you may have met me before, either potentially in person or virtually last year on our Fieldwork Live live lessons. But to those of you who have not, my name is Lou and I work for the Field Studies Council, which is sometimes known as the FSC. We are an environmental education charity that run field centres all across the UK, the kind of places that you may visit on a school trip. Now, over the next three weeks, we're going to be showing you a range of things that you can do outside and things that you can do at home. But most importantly, all of those things are to do with nature. We're going to be looking at birds, wild skills, having a peeping into some ponds and thinking about things to do on a walk, which is what today's episode is all about. Now, in each of our episodes, we're going to take you on a bit of a journey. We're going to be taking you to different centres all across the UK. So today you are joining me at Juniper Hall, which is down in the southeast of England in Surrey. You can see this picture behind me that we are on the side of Box Hill, where we have really lovely follies such as this one here. Now, if you have been extra prepared, you will have signed up for this live lesson, which means that you should hopefully have been sent your resource pack and things such as this spotter guide and maybe a worksheet like this one. If you do not have those resources, don't panic. You can still go to our website at Field Studies Council, have a look underneath the Primary Nature Live tab where you can sign up and still download them and you can do them later. Now, before we get stuck into this Primary Nature Live lesson, we have a few shout outs. So huge welcome to Starling Class from Norbury Primary School. We are joined by Alex and Frankie, ooh, all the way up north from me in the Lake District. We've got Chris and Amala and all of their friends from Muxton Primary School. Hi, guys. Um, oh, a huge hello to all the children, staff and parents from All Saints COV School in Putney. We've got IRB Church of England School in Cumbria on here. And finally, we have Mr Peck and everyone at St Thomas More's School in Colchester. Now, throughout this live lesson, I will do some more shout outs later on. Some of you as well may have some questions and some of you have already sent some in. So I'll answer those as we go. If you would like to get involved during today's live lesson, you can do that in the YouTube live chat and I'll answer as many of those as I can towards the end of the lesson. If you would also like a shout out, tell me your name or your school and I'll try and pop in as many of those as I can later on as well. To use the live chat, you will need a YouTube account, so you will need an adult to help you with that. Really importantly though, you must treat this live chat for today's live lesson like you would do a lesson in school with one of your teachers. So please only ask the sorts of comments or questions that you would have if you were in a classroom at school. If you cannot see the live chat to the right of the video, you will need to get an adult to help you log in and then you just need to refresh the web page. Now, I'm not alone here on this live lesson today. I am joined by some of my colleagues in the chat too. So they're going to be keeping an eye on all those comments and questions coming in. And throughout this live lesson, they will be answering some of those for you as well. Now, something exciting, throughout our five live lessons, we are running a competition for you all this year. In each episode, there will be a letter of the alphabet for you to spot. And if you watch every single episode, you'll collect all five letters which you need to reorder in order to spell the secret word. At the end of today's lesson I will pop all the details you need to know on how to enter the competition and at the end of all of it a winner will be picked at random. So, so you can find out today's secret letter, let's crack on with our first live lesson. So today we're hopping over to the east of England, I had to think about that for a second, to FSC Flatford Mill in Suffolk to get some ideas of things to do on a walk. There are a few items for you to spot in the background of this video, including the letter for the competition, have a look out for the FSC logo, and Jo has placed somewhere in the background of her videos her favourite cuddly animal. 
Well, in this video as well, we also have one extra special animal that made an appearance. Keep your eyes peeled for when Jo is looking for her stick as there is something that runs in the background. If you think you know what that animal is, tell us in the YouTube chat box and I'll let you know later if you were correct. Now, if you have your welcome pack in front of you, you can work alongside Jo and tick off different things as you see them, such as this Signs of Winter Spotter Guide. So let's head over to Flatford Mill to see what Jo has in store. Thanks Lou. Hi guys, I'm Jo. I work at Flatford Mill, which is an FSC centre. And I'm here today to show you some fun and interesting stuff to do if you're going out on a walk in your local environment. So we're going to head off in a moment, but before we do that, I'm going to find a journey stick. Now, a journey stick is something that we're going to attach things to as we go round our walk in order to just remind us of some of the things that we've seen and some of the things that we've done. So I need to find a good stick. I'll look around. I'm looking for the stickiest stick I can find. Well, this one looks good, so I'll just mine the nettles. Right. This stick looks great. It's good because it's already got some interesting things on it. So there's some lichens here. And it's also got lots of little branches that I can stick things onto as I go. So we're gonna head off now and go on our walk. Join me. magnificent trees that are in our woodlands. Lots of people that come to our centres at the FSC often ask us to help them to identify trees and actually it's really quite a hard thing to do. In the spring and the summer it's much easier because when they've got leaves on you can use really good guides. I've got some here. So this one is the FSC guide. This is the one that we make and you can buy this from our website. Um, and it just shows you an entire name trail of how to identify different trees by looking at their leaves. Obviously at the moment that's really hard because they haven't got any leaves on them. These trees are deciduous so they drop their leaves um, in the autumn and they haven't regrown them yet for the spring. So if you look on the floor at the base of this tree there are lots and lots of leaves that dropped in the autumn. So we want to find a whole one. This one's been eaten a little bit. So if I find a better one. So here's quite a good one here. That shows you the shape of the leaves that were on this tree. Now you might recognise the shape of that leaf because it's quite a common tree. This is a, a good old English uh, tree here. So we're going to have a look and try and identify this tree using the leaves. So if we use our guide here, the first page asks some questions. Okay, so this one, the first question is, are the leaves small and scaly um, and pointed? Okay, so it's not one of those trees. It's none of these trees here. These are evergreen trees. So we're gonna follow the trail along all the way to this side here where the next question says are the leaves including any leaflets as long as they are wide so that's a no because this leaf is much longer than it is wide okay so it's a tall leaf so we're going to go along here onto this page so this question says is the leaf divided into lobes now if you think about lobes i've got an earlobe here which is a lobe shape so does this have lobes yes great so we're going up here okay and then we answer a few more questions about the shape um, and where the leaf comes from and we end up here so hopefully you can see that this looks like our leaf obviously it's a different color because this one's dead but we're looking at an oak tree um, so the other thing to think about is this bark. Oak trees have really nice knobbly bark. It feels really rough, okay? And it's got lots and lots of kind of lines and cracks in it. That's why oak trees are so amazing because there 
are host to so many different creatures, insects and spiders and all sorts of amazing creepy crawlies that live in their leaves, as well as obviously things like squirrels that build um, their drays, which are their nests up in their branches. But not just kind of animals live in these things, we also have lots of fungus that grow on oak. And as you might be able to see, if we go this way, on this dead oak trunk, we've got some sulfur tuft fungus growing. So that's actually growing and eating the oak tree um, because it's dead, so it's, it's decomposing it. So what you can do is you can have a look at these, um, these guides. And we've also got some spotter guides to show you as well. And in a moment, I'll show you, look around here and we'll see if we can spot some of the things on our spotter guides. Before we go and use our spotter guides, we need to put something on our journey stick that's gonna remind me of this journey. And what better than a beautiful oak tree from my lovely big oak there. So I'm gonna put this one on. It's got a, a convenient hole in the leaf, which I'm gonna thread on to my stick. Try not to break it, otherwise it will fall off. So that's my reminder of this worm. So we also said about the um, spotter guides. So the first one I'd like you guys to try and think about is anything on this winter spotter guide. So we've got bare branches, lots of those around. Dead leaves on the floor, you might see some of those. Um, frost, it's too sunny today for a frost, I think. Um, but we might see some holly, uh, maybe some pine trees and maybe a squirrel dray, as I mentioned before, the, the nest that squirrel makes, they sort of round up in the top of the trees and some, maybe some um, snowdrops, some signs of spring. Okay, so follow me and we'll have a look and see what we can find. Oh, I've already seen a nice holly leaf here. So you can see nice and spiky, okay. This one hasn't got any berries on it at the moment. It might have had. Um, you might have seen some holly in your Christmas decorations, but um, these ones are, uh, they, ha they haven't got any berries on them. Let's see what else we can find around. There's some lovely snowdrops here. You can just see them coming out of the ground. Beautiful. They're really good at surviving in the cold. So they're kind of the first things that you'll, you'll see growing. So lovely snowdrops, we can tick that off our list to stand on them and then also I've noticed up in this tree right up at the top I don't know if you can follow my finger looking up at the top there's a squirrel dray up there in the in the kind of v-shaped branches right up the top so there might be a little squirrel that lives up there as well okay make sure you keep looking out for those things, see if you see any other um, of our things on our spotter guide. And we're gonna head off now and find a tree to meet. So nice being out in the woodland. It's quite a windy day and the trees are all swaying and there's loads of noise. And it's really refreshing being out and about in nature. This is an area with lots of lovely trees. So I think what we need to do is meet a tree. Now, if you're gonna do this, you're gonna need a family member with you because it's much better if you can turn this into a bit of a game. So what we'll do is, you're gonna be blindfolded. I'm gonna to have to blindfold myself. I'm gonna put my journey stick somewhere safe so that I don't lose it. So I'm gonna to have to blindfold myself, but obviously you'll get um, a family member to do that for you. And they're gonna go, they're gonna choose a tree and lead you to it. And then you're gonna to try to discover everything you can about that tree. So I'm gonna put my blindfold on and I'll be led to a tree. Okay, I'm at my tree. So the first thing I want to do is to find out a bit about this tree. I think I'm gonna try and find out how wide the tree is. Oh lovely I could stay here all day so I know this tree fits into my arms I can touch my hands together so I know about how big the tree is I don't know how tall the tree is but I know it's much taller than I am 
how does it feel? It feels very, very rough. It feels like there's lots of bits that are kind of crispy almost that are sticking up. But in between that, there's really smooth sections and it feels like there's little lines running across it. So it's kind of alternating between very, very smooth and what feels like it should be shiny and then rough sections that are moving across the tree and then these kind of crispy bits as well. I'll give it a sniff, see how it smells. Well, it smells gorgeous. It smells like a tree to be fair, but it does smell lovely. Maybe it tastes nice. No, no, it doesn't taste nice. It tastes horrible. No. Okay, so I know that my tree feels very distinctive with its smooth and rough parts. It smells gorgeous and it's got some moss on it, but it doesn't taste very nice. So what we would do now is if you were with your family, they take you away from your tree, maybe spin you around if you're feeling sort of brave and then take your blindfold off. And then you'd have to find your tree. Now it's easy for me because I haven't been spun round or moved because we, I'm here sort of on my own with the camera person. So I know this is my tree and I can now see those things that I saw, all those smooth sections with the rough lines on it. Now that's given me a clue because I know that this, that means this is a cherry tree because they have this very, very special bark with the lines on. And there's my moss. Okay, so we've met our tree. What do I need to do? I've got to put something on my journey stick. Now, oh, look at this. Yes, I've got a bit of bark from the cherry tree. You can see if I hold it really up close, there's those shiny and rough sections. So I'm gonna pop that on there. Looks like it's wearing a little jacket now. Okay, and then we're gonna head off and see what else we can find. Come on. We've already introduced ourselves to some trees. What I think we should do now is try and find out a bit more about some of those trees. One of the things we can do is we can look at how old the trees are around here. What we've got here is a cut tree stump. And if you look closely at any tree stumps that you see, you might be able to see some tree rings. You'll need to look very closely though. All trees have growth rings showing when they've laid down lots of growth and when they've rested. And if you look very closely, you can see these banded on the tree ring going out. If you get a clear one, you can count the rings and you can estimate how old the tree is. But obviously, we don't want to be cutting trees down in order to work out how old they are. So we need to think of another way of estimating the age. Oh, I've just found a conker. I'm gonna put that on my journey stick because conkers are about new life and growth. So that's gonna remind me of looking at the tree rings. There we go. If you've got your handouts, this is when you can start to fill them in. We're heading into the nature garden here at Flatford Mill because there's a great tree I want to show you. We're gonna look at this tree. This is an ash tree. Now again, it's hard to identify at the moment because of the lack of leaves. But if you look up into the branches, you can see some of the seeds which are like wispy, they're called ash keys because they look like a bunch of keys hanging from the branches. So I know this is an ash tree. Another thing we can do is to do a bark rubbing. Now you've got this on your sheet. The first thing it says is to look at the leaves and draw a picture. Now I've already drawn mine because obviously there aren't very many leaves around at the moment, but I managed to find a, a sort of dead ash leaf to do a quick sketch of. So that's one thing you can do. The next says, can you describe the bark? What's it like? So you can describe the bark on your tree. I'm going to move on to doing a bark rubbing. So if you've never done a bark rubbing before, you're going to need a crayon, a 
any colour, choose your favourite. And then you're going to hold the paper against the bark, like so. And then use the crayon to scrape up and down the bark. Okay, don't worry if you go out of the lines, that's all part of it. And then you can see the print of what your bark looked like. Another thing that we can do is we can look at measuring the height of our tree. Now this is quite a big tree, so we're not going to be able to climb it and measure from the top down. So instead, what we're gonna do is we're gonna try and measure how tall the tree would be if it was lying on the ground, okay? So the way we're gonna do that is we're gonna use a bit of maths and also a bit of stretching. We're gonna walk away from the base of the tree, so I'm gonna walk out in this direction. We're gonna carry on until we can bend over, look between our legs and see the top of the tree. So I'll have to keep stopping and making sure that I can see it. Okay, so I'm gonna start walking out, but I do need to just pick up my journey stick. Make sure I haven't lost anything. So from the base of my tree, I'm walking out about 10 paces, I'll try first. Now I want to create a triangle with my legs and then bend over and see if I can see the top of the tree. And lose my hat. I definitely can't see the top. Let's keep going. I'll try here. Same result. <laughs> Keep going. Maybe here. Oh, yes, I can see the top of the tree. So what that means is between my feet and the base of the tree, is the same distance as the tree is high. So we're basically creating a right angle to triangle. So what I need to do is to measure from my feet to the base of the tree. Now I've got a tape measure that I can do that with. If you don't have a tape measure, you can just step it out. So one foot in front of the other, and then you can measure your feet. So we're going to head back now to Lou. All right then guys, so welcome back. Now I'm going to start with a bit of an apology. Some of you have been saying that the videos of Joe are lagging a little bit. That might be because we're live and because of the internet, so I can only apologise. What we're going to do is after this video is finished this afternoon, we'll re-upload them later on. So if you want to skip back through to certain sections, you should be able to. But hopefully some of you were able to spot all of our items in the background. So there was Joe's favourite cuddly toy and the FSC logo. As I said, if you've missed any of these, well, you can go back later on this afternoon and skip to certain points so you can have another look. Some of you though, did say that you spotted something strange moving behind Jo when she was looking for her stick. Now it did move incredibly fast, so it was super hard to spot, and that's because it was trying to run away. Now that animal was a monk jack, okay, which is a type of small deer and looks a little bit like this. Now don't be fooled by them and by how small and kind of cute and cuddly they look. They are incredibly solid and stocky and the males can weigh anything up to 18 kilograms. That's the same as having to carry around 26 iPads or electronic tablets. As I said, if you want to double check and see if you can spot it, you can look back on the videos when we re-upload them later on for you. So it's time for a few more shout outs. You've all been very, very keen. I love it. Um, so we are joined by Tilly from Millway Primary. We've got Lewis from Prim Plymouth Grove Primary. We've got Ewan, Timmy and Micah from Clangothlin. Uh, we're also joined by Joe's nieces, Lola and Daisy. I hope you're enjoying watching your Auntie Jo. Does she often go around licking trees? Um, hello to All Saints Primary in Putney. We've also got Giles Brook School in Milton Keynes. 
and we're joined by the lovely reception class in St Thomas More's School in Colchester. Finally, we've got Year 3 from Unity Academy in Blackpool. I will do a few more shout outs when we have a chance later on. Now, spotting those snowdrops in Joe's video reminded me of something that I saw on Christmas Eve when I went for a walk. I walked just up the road from Juniper Hall to our little village of Mickleham to have a look at all the Christmas decorations that everyone had put up. And when I got up into the village, some of the trees in the churchyard had this beautiful pink blossom on them. Now I've lived here for four years and I have never seen blossom in the churchyard in December. Normally it comes out in sort of March, April-ish time. Now I'm sure many of you have heard about climate change and how it can affect us all on earth as well as the animals and plants that live here. What you might start to notice on your walks is because we are starting to experience a warmer climate, some of our animals and plants are starting to get a little bit confused. I know how they feel. You may see lambs starting to be born in February rather than April and snowdrops such as the ones that Joe saw starting to appear in January or as was the case for me, Blossom is starting to appear in some places in December. In the chat box, I would love to hear what things you are all doing at home to try and reduce any impacts of climate change. And if you aren't sure, I would love it if you can find out and then tell me either on the next video on Thursday or with the help of an adult, you could take, you could like take some photos or share it with me on Twitter, Instagram, or what's the other one on Facebook uh, using the hashtag primary nature live. Again, with social media, I would also love to see anything that you make or do from these live lessons, such as your nature sticks when you go out for your walks. So again, if you take a photo of those and upload them, I might be able to print them out and show them in our next live lesson. So some of you may know that I have a very, very special pet and he has actually been making quite a lot of noise during these little live segments. If you've watched Philbert Live last year, you would have met him, but if you don't know what I'm talking about, I will give you a little clue. He can fit into a shoebox and he has a shell. He also likes to eat things like dandelions and kale. If you think you know what my pet is and you think you know his name, tell me in the YouTube chat box and if you are correct, I'll introduce him to you all in a little bit. But now though, it's time to go back to Joe for one last look at things to do, things for us to do on a walk. So Joe, it's over to you. One of the things that's really great about being on a nature walk is just experiencing the sounds and smells and the air around you and what's going on. So what I'd like to do is to do a bit of a sit spot. You can do this in a garden, in your garden, you can do it in a park, you can do it in a woods. You can really do it anywhere, but you want to find somewhere that's kind of quite quiet and um, not got a lot of cars or lots of man-made sounds going past. So you can really hear the natural sounds around you. You've got a sheet in your handout that shows you where you can do this soundscape, which is where we're going to basically draw what we can hear. I'm going to do mine on this so that you can see it more clearly. The air smells quite fresh here. There's no overpowering sounds. Um, so I'm going to use this as my really good space to sit and do a sound spot. So I'm just going to sit here really quietly and try and hear everything around me. I can definitely hear birds. So my sound spot, my soundscape, that's me in the middle on my tree trunk. I can hear a bird in that direction and it's quite a loud bird. So there's my bird, there's maybe two. And those sounds are quite loud and they're chirpy, lots of noise. So I'm gonna do some wiggly lines coming towards me. I can hear people talking in that direction.
They're not singing, but I'll make them sing. Can you hear footsteps over there? Ooh. I just heard a water bird over there in the river. I can also hear the river moving, so I'm going to do some ripply lines for my river. And I'll try and draw a duck. Oh dear. It's not a very good duck, but maybe it's maybe it sounds like a duck. There seems to be even more birds over there. I'm going to add some. They look a bit like seagulls, although I don't think they are seagulls. They're tweeting. It's really interesting because in my soundscape, I can't hear anything really from this direction. It's very quiet over there. In the spring and the summer, they have sheep in that field, so you'd probably be able to draw a sheep there if we could hear them, but they're not there at the moment. So what I want you to do when you go out is to create your own soundscape of what you can hear. It's really interesting to try and think about how far away things are or how close they are, how loud they are. Would they be louder in the summer? Would there be different sounds in the summer? It might be really nice to recreate your soundscape in the same spot at a different time of year. Definitely the loudest sound is my birds. Once you've created your sound spot, you could keep it in your hands out or you could take a photo and tweet us with it. So before we go in, I need to put something onto my journey stick. My conker keeps falling off. I need to put something on my journey stick from this last point. So I'm feeling pretty happy here. It's very relaxing. So I'm going to try and look for something bright. Oh, look, I've got a bright ivy leaf here, bright yellow. So it's my sunny, happy feeling. Even though it's winter, I'm still feeling bright and sunny. So I'm going to put that on my journey stick too. So we're just here looking at some natural art. Now on my walk around the woodland here at Flatford, I collected loads of different things that I just found interesting um, or were particularly uh, kind of a different shape or an exciting colour or something that made me um, kind of think that it could be really useful for creating some natural art. So I've been inspired by Andy Goldsworthy to create this. So these are some of his um, some of his artworks. He is amazing. He uses bright colours and shapes and is inspired by the natural landscape to create these beautiful pictures. So here's one that he made. Um, he's made loads. Look him up. It's really, it's really fascinating. Um, this is a beautiful one that I, I absolutely love. Um, based around the fungus that was already there, he's then created this beautiful piece of art. So I've tried to make my own um, and hopefully you'll have a go at this too. So um, in classic Blue Peter style, here's what I made earlier. So you can see my tray here full of things that I've collected. Um, so we've got some sort of seed pom-poms from a London plane and some fir cones um, and some interesting leaves and seeds. And I've tried to create, well, I hope you guys can see what this is. Um, I'll just move that back because it's flown away a little bit. Okay, so I hope you can see what this is. Uh, if you can't, it is meant to be my water bird that I heard earlier um, or some kind of um, fascinating uh, bird creature. And I've actually incorporated my journey stick into my picture. So um, the bird here is perched on the branch and then obviously you've got the beak and the eye here. Um, and it's got a bit of colour as well, some berries I found. Now, do you just be careful, obviously, that it doesn't blow away, but also if you touch and pick up any berries and things like that, just make sure that you wash your hands afterwards, so um, just being safe. But um, just think about, you know, getting an adult to help you so that they can um, help you decide what's good to use and what's not. So I really hope that you do some environmental art, some nature art, and please do share it with us. Um, so you need to take a photo of it and get an adult to help you put it on Twitter um, with the hashtag primary nature live. Okay. And then we'll be able to see it and hopefully Lou can uh, kind of talk about some of the best ones that she sees next week. Okay, guys, it's been an absolute pleasure. So back to you, Lou. See you later.
Jo, in her little segment there, talked about sit spots. Now, sit spots are some of my, one of my favourite activities to do if I'm feeling a little bit stressed or maybe a little bit anxious, which, to be honest, at the moment, thing that's going on, I feel that quite a lot. So I quite like often just to take myself out either into the garden or on a walk and just sit myself down for 20 minutes and just listen to what's going on. They're a really, really lovely way for you just to be able to sit and relax for even two minutes or as long as 20 minutes as I do it just to help you kind of reconnect and make yourself feel a little bit better. Now lots of you have been guessing what my pet is and many of you are correct. Here he is, he is my tortoise and this one is named Angus. Now some of you might remember from last year that Angus is a type of a tortoise called a Russian horsefield tortoise and they can be found roaming the deserts kind of around by like Afghanistan and that sort of area. Um, he is a weed eating tortoise so he loves nothing better than some dandelions but at the moment there aren't very many around so he is making do with kale. Now he's being a bit grumpy at the moment and that's because he's really really cold. Tortoises are reptiles, which means they are cold-blooded. Now, as humans, as mammals, we're warm-blooded, which means that our blood in our system keeps us at a lovely temperature. Angus, unfortunately, though, can't do that. What he has to do every morning is I switch on a light for him, which he sits underneath and does this thing called basking. This heats up his blood and then means he can move around much quicker. Very common misconception that tortoises are slow. They're actually really, really quick. They just have to be warm first. Now I'm gonna put him down because he has got these really, really sharp kind of like, I suppose they're like nails or claws and they're not hurting me. They're just a bit uncomfortable, but he uses them to climb and mostly escape at places he doesn't want to be. So I'm gonna put him back down where he's got some kale and hopefully I'll get him out next time. Now you've all been sending in loads of shout outs and questions as well so let's do a few of those. So first of all hello to everyone from Inverne Brafok Primary School, I hope I said that right. We've got Lily from Samuel Lucas School. We're also joined by St Joseph's Catholic Primary. We've got Alex, Noah and all the children from Badger class in Chewton Mendip School. Absolutely love badgers, they're one of my favourites. Oh, so we're joined by Barnaby, Jemima and Annabelle. Now Jemima in particular has a good question for us. She wants to know, how does water help plants grow? Now for plants, water does two really important things. The first thing is that in order to grow and to stay alive, plants need nutrients like nitrogen and phosphorus, which can often be found in the soil. And when that soil gets wet, these nutrients can dissolve into it. Now, unlike us, plants can't just take a load of soil and scoop it up and munch it down, although please don't go eating any soil. Okay, so what plants do instead is very cleverly, they absorb and they take in that water through their underground root system, meaning they can get those important substances that they need. So that's the first thing. The second thing they need water for in order to help them to grow is plants need water for a, pro a process called photosynthesis. This is where plants use three things. They use carbon dioxide, sunlight and our all important water and they cleverly with a chemical reaction use them to create food and oxygen and then again this helps them to continue growing so they can be nice and big and strong. So that was that, that was a really good first question, thank you Jemima. So our second question is about, oh, how do trees get their lines or rings? Now so first of all then, on the outside of the tree, the lines come from the bark which changes shape or may crack to form patterns and that those patterns will depend on a couple of things. So the first thing is actually the type of tree. You can look at the bark, as Joe said, and that can help you work out what tree it is. But also the weather. If it's been really, really wet and then suddenly gets really hot, this might cause the bark to perhaps crack, okay, which would give us some of those lumps and bumps. Now the rings inside the tree form as the tree grows throughout the year. Each line that you can see when you look inside those trees is a new growth of tissue and this leaves different marks inside the tree which we can then see as rings. 
Now we've got, oh, class six from Borad Chalk Primary School have a follow on question to that. And they want to know, how do these tree rings show evidence of climate change? Now, this is a really great question. And the answer is yes, tree rings can tell us a lot about how our climate has changed in the past. So dendrochronologists, who are the people or scientists that study tree rings, use these rings to predict what has happened to past kind of like climates that these trees have experienced. Dendrochronologists look at the rings to see their size, as in the winter they tend to be really quite small because the tree doesn't grow very much, whereas in the summer they tend to be much bigger. So first of all they can identify when those two seasons are. But these scientists can then also identify any unusual patterns and then these patterns can tell them if a tree was under stress, perhaps because there was like a drought or even too much rain. And from this, they can then work out what our past climate was like to build us up a bit of a picture. So those are really great questions. Thank you very much, guys. So you all saw Joe using one of our ID guides, such as, I've lost it, there we go, such as this one, okay? This is our tree like name trail, and you saw her using it in order to identify one of those trees. Some of you have been asking about these guides. If you would like to buy one, we do have them for sale on our publications website. So just go onto Google and just type in FSE publications with an adult. And we have got absolutely hundreds on there. So we've got ones about uh, pond life. We've got some about reptiles, which is one of my favorite ones to help you identify UK snakes and lizards. Um, what other ones do we have? Some about birds and plants and orchids and things like that, okay? Um, other things that we would love is don't forget to get an adult to send photos of any artwork or nature creations into us on Twitter, Facebook or Instagram. And if you use the hashtag Primary Nature Live, I will be able to have a look and see them and then might be able to share some when we come back on Thursday. Now, lots of you seem very excited about the idea of a competition and winning the prize. So you, as a reminder, you can enter after the very final episode in a few weeks time, once you have arranged your letters into our secret word. Once you've got your secret word, you can email us with your name and that password, and we will put up the details of where to email to at the end of each episode. I hope you have enjoyed this week. As you know, these episodes have been put on for free, but as we are a charity, if you would like to make a donation, please head over to our website where you can donate through there. So that is all for now. See you next time for our brilliant birds episode on Thursday, where we're going to be joining my friend Kaylee right here at Juniper Hall. In this episode, she'll be showing you lots of really great things, but a big one that I'm excited by is how to make a bird feeder. So if you download the resources from the Primary Nature Live website, um, you will know what you need to get together so you can actually build your bird feeder alongside her and she will tell you how to do it. So from myself and Angus, who's wandered off, he's had, had enough. See you on Thursday.